a pigeon shit on my head. <laughs> it was a sign. I was in Bangkok to study massage at a Buddhist temple. The other American students I knew from my semester at the National University of Singapore had headed south for bikinis on the beach time. Not me. I wanted more than that. Or, more to the point, I wanted to be a person who wanted more than that. So I set off for Bangkok on a train by myself to learn massage at a Buddhist temple. I wasn't aware of how desperately I was trying to be different, but I did know that I liked the idea of fate. I was 20, I was a romantic, and I wanted to believe in signs. Clearly, I was afraid of nothing. That is an advantage of the combination of wanting to be different and wanting to believe in fate. If it is meant to happen, it will happen. No fear necessary. Sign me up to backpack alone and let me add on to that lying to my parents about where I was so they wouldn't worry. Fear would have made me conventional and that is what I really feared. Once in Bangkok, though, it was hot and humid, even by this southerner's standards. At the temple grounds where the massage training was given outside, there were rows of cots lined up under red roof shelters with the noisy street on one side and people streaming past on the other side on their way inside the temple. The reality of being in noisy, crowded Bangkok and being hot and sweaty while massaging hot and sweaty people was overwhelming. <laughs> That's when the pigeon shit on my head. <laughs> Fate was directing me somewhere else. That pigeon gave me a way out. <laughs> I went back to my backpacker's dive, washed my hair in the little spigot they used to claim they had running water, and packed up to see where fate would take me next. Most of the other backpackers were headed to Koh Samui, so I picked Hua Hin, a place where Thai people vacationed, probably to get away from backpackers like me. <laughs> Hua Hin had a beautiful beach, stretching in a crescent further than I could walk without a bad sunburn. So what if I could only afford to stay at the working end of the beach where fishing boats were repaired and the catch was left drying in the sun? It smelled like I was doing something different. <laughs> and that's where I was sitting with my backpack on the sand when Drew came up to me. Do you speak English? Oh, great. Another American backpacker. I was annoyed. I'm from South Carolina, I said. It so really did not answer his question that we both had to laugh. We traveled together after that. Drew was trying just as hard to be different as I was, but he had been at it longer and was lonely. I didn't want to admit it, but I was lonely too. So of course that's who I lost my virginity to. <laughs> in a five-star hotel in Phuket, <laughs> the kind of place that has baby elephants walking around to amuse the tourists. <laughs> <laughs> we checked in with his dad's in case of emergency credit card. Two middle-class white kids trying to be different, ending up so terribly conventional. <laughs> yes, I was 20, traveling alone in Thailand, and a virgin a trifecta of rarities. <laughs> it wasn't like I was trying to be a virgin, though. I had gotten off to a slow start because home perms on a bookworm is a bit of a handicap. <laughs> then I thought I was going to be a Methodist minister for a while, which slowed my roll considerably. <laughs> In college, my first date with my first boyfriend was to a traveling production of Evita. He now performs every week in Columbia's ultimate free drag show <laughs> as patio furniture. <laughs> <laughs> my next boyfriend was more interested in dropping acid than having sex. And it is hard to lose your virginity to someone lying on the floor talking to a giant tomato. 
So there I was in Thailand with my virginity and Mr. Do You Speak English and his dad's credit card. It was fate. <laughs> I thought this was the person I was meant to be with. Why else had that bird shit on my head? <laughs> Drew and I traveled together for a couple more weeks, playing house in cheap hotels, buying veggies in the local markets and cooking them over his camp stove, stealing honey from the morning banana pancakes to lick off each other's bodies. We talked, snorkeled, explored our surroundings and each other. It was fun. <laughs> he was from Seattle and I was from South Carolina, so when it was time to fly home, we were left with letters and expensive long-distance phone calls in those pre-internet days. We planned to be reunited the next summer at his family's cabin at Canada Lake in New York State. I used all my frequent flyer miles to buy the ticket to get there, and once the non-refundable ticket had been purchased, I got the letter telling me he had met the love of his life, and she was not me. In his letter, he said he still wanted to be friends, and that I was still invited to the lake. I was heartbroken but I am also terribly stubborn. And I was damned if I was gonna waste that ticket. So I decided to travel to meet up with Drew anyway. My friends thought I was crazy. I did not think Drew and I would get back together, but fate was at work and I wanted to see where it would take me next. The lake was amazing. One of those places where you drive down a dirt road forever park at the boat dock and take the boat to the big old house because there are no roads. The lake itself was clear and cold and surrounded by forests. I heard the cry of loons for the first time there. It was late summer and after climbing out of the lake, we'd run in and warm ourselves by the fireplace. Of course, things were different between Drew and me. Drew had a friend, Josh, from spending his childhood summers at this lake. And now that Drew was no longer an option, I tried as hard as I could to make Josh be the one fate was directing me to. Yes, a bird shit on my head in Bangkok so that I would meet this guy in upstate New York. No, it didn't make any sense, but my destiny thread was getting stretched very thin, but I still wanted it all to mean something. The last night at the lake, Drew, Josh, and the other neighbors from this camp had an end of the summer bash complete with a whole pig roasted on a spit over an open fire. This was 1991, the heyday of Iron John, Robert Bly, and if you don't remember it, there were lots of men's drum circles and tests of strength. <laughs> Think Luke running through the swamp with Yoda on his back. <laughs> well, up there at Canada Lake, Late into the evening, this guy Josh started wild man dancing around the fire, swinging an ax around his head. It was quickly becoming clear to me that this iron Josh was not the guy for me. <laughs> then the metal head, the ax part of the ax, flew off its handle and out into the night. None of us around the bonfire were hit but my belief in fate was dead. That was just stupid, dumb luck. Random chance that I did not have an ax embedded in my head with the impossibility of receiving timely medical care. <laughs> I was in this alone. There was no narrative arc. My decisions were just that, mine. And in this existential crisis, all the fear of what I had done and what I was doing settled down on me. What the hell was I thinking? How was I not dead? I may have lost my virginity in Thailand, but it was there that night in upstate New York that I lost my innocence. Mary Wilson. <laughs>